today's colloquium, uh, which is going to be given by our own Professor Munson. So uh, since in some ways Professor Munson is uh, a little bit unconventional, I thought that um, uh, my introduction today would be a little bit unconventional. And so it's actually going to be a little bit of a quiz to see how much you know uh, about him. First, does anybody know his full name? <laughs> Mylon Stephen Burnaby Munson. Anybody hear that? Mylon Stephen Burnaby Munson. Very good. All right. Does anybody happen to know where he's from? Yes. <laughs> anybody else? Wharton, Texas. Wharton, Texas. That's closer to my advice for where he's from. Yeah. <laughs> okay, excellent. And uh, where, where did he get his bachelor's degree? He's from Texas. Yeah. <laughs> and it wasn't A&M. Yeah. 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 Oh, that's <laughs> Oh, no, but, no, but he uh, started out uh, that he actually got his uh, BS from oh, uh, UT Austin. That is PhD. Well, but yeah, we'll, we'll get there in a moment. But not only did he get his BS, he got it with highest honors. So those of you that are undergraduates who are getting an honors degree, remember, Professor Munson got the highest honors. So there we go. Okay, where did he get his master's degree? Well, you know, if you're from Texas, UT Austin. Where did he get his PhD? Well, if you're from Texas, UT Austin. And then how did you ever go then to the University of Wisconsin then for a postdoc? No, it wasn't a postdoc, it was before. I got a master's oh. degree in, at, at Austin and was told you really shouldn't get a PhD. I spent one year in Wisconsin. I have never been so cold before in Wisconsin. <laughs> It's a totally uninhabitable part of the world. <laughs> and then uh, from his PhD, he went to work for a company called ESSO Research and Engineering. Does anybody know what ESSO is today? <laughs> Professor Burmeister is just kidding. Exxon Mobile. Exxon Mobile, yes. Where ESSO is called Humble. Yes, it was Humble, but yes, before then. Uh, so uh, uh, these companies change. And in fact, there, um, uh, oh, uh, he did some mass spectrometry that maybe we'll hear a little bit about. And in fact, um, uh, I don't know if you're going to talk about this today, but you should at least sometime because um, uh, your seminal paper in JAX on chemical ionization is an exa excellent example of how reviewers don't always appreciate work that is ahead of its time. Yes, I shall show that. Story. Yeah. <laughs> So uh, from there, he came to, here to the University of Delaware in 19, well, does anybody know what, what year he came? Came here to the University of Delaware. So it's a good thing we have Professor Frank. 1967. 1967, yes. And uh, as an assistant professor, and yes, uh, somehow he came up through the ranks uh, to full professor. And um, uh, so he's been here, what, 46 years now, is that right? So great. Uh, every one of them. Yeah, every, yes, yes, we remember, you remember every one of them. Um, I will just, he has a huge list of awards. I'm just going to tell you about three of them. The first is the Franklin and Field Award for Outstanding Achievement in Mass Spectrometry. Uh, that's given by the American Chemical Society, really the top award uh, in uh, the area of mass spectrometry, ion chemistry, and such uh, that, uh, that you can get in the ACS. Uh, uh, he uh, shortly thereafter received the Francis Allison Award from the University of Delaware, which is the highest honor that any faculty member can get uh, at the University of Delaware. And um, also there is uh, an organiza organization called the American Society for Mass Spectrometry, which also he got what I would consider their highest award as well, uh, which is the ASMS Award for Distinguished Contribution in Mass Spectrometry. So, um, I, and in fact, uh, I, in 2002, you know, there uh, was a Nobel Prize, maybe you don't know this, but there was a Nobel Prize that was awarded for instrumentation related to characterization of biomolecules. And a big part of that was mass spectrometry. Now, Professor Munson, regrettably, did not win uh, the Nobel Prize award. But uh, as you know, uh, if you look at these in the little synopsis that the committee will put out of um, uh, you know, this development led to this, which led to this, which led to this, and so forth. And then finally, 
these people did the work that um, uh, we're honoring today. Reference number one, what started it all, is Munson and Field from uh, uh, that Jack's article back uh, in 1965 or 66, I can't remember, but anyway. Yes, uh, 65 from, uh, or 66. Uh, uh, <laughs> <laughs> so uh, with that, I don't want to take any more time, but uh, let's welcome Burnaby to the podium. Yes, I am as old as I look, and I feel at least that old. All right, so let's go on with this. You, you notice the somewhat archaic type that's there. This gives you a chance to practice your a calligraphy and ability to read. OK, in the beginning in mass spectrometry, the classic thing is Thompson's book. And actually, the reason why I'm giving this talk is that this is the centennial of the publication of this book. 1913. Uh, it sometimes is, it is the first book in mass spectrometry, although I doubt if it's really the most important book in mass spectrometry because remarkably few people seem to have ever read it and used it. Okay, but the beginning isn't always quite the same. It's not quite the beginning. Uh, the classic things that you'll see in freshman chemistry books is Goldstein's canal rays in, in 1886. But you go back before that, it was observed that um, a discharge in gas produced different produced compounds so that you could see them. Uh, probably the beginning is Veen's article in 1898 in which he observed that the discharge, the canal rays, were uh, deflected by magnetic fields, so they were charged particles. And then Thomson himself did several things before 1914. So before 1940, but 1910, there's an article. Uh, and again, no, I couldn't find Phil Mag uh, on there. But he'd observed uh, those species by the mass spectrometer. And yes, in sort of honesty in this, all of these references came from a, a very well-written uh, article on the history of mass spectrometry. Um, used to be, it were talked about mass spectrography and mass spectrometry. And there was at one time a distinction between them. Mass spectrograph used a photographic plate, and as Aston insisted on it, he made his separations by mass. Uh, Dempster, uh, electrical detection of the uh, beam, and separation by momentum. But the generic word was mass spectroscopy, and I doubt that anybody in the room under the age of 60 has ever heard of that term. If you go back, these are one of the classic things. Thompson had a parabola ray mass spectrometer that was there, an electric discharge which produced ions with a monstrous amount of energy. So in this particular case, this is the spectrum which he observed of mercury. And you see, let's see if I can do that. I, pointing with that thing, if pointer is hopeless, I'm not much better with this. Mercury plus one going up to mercury plus three, sorry, plus five, which is a very significant amount of energy produced in the, uh, in the discharge. If you look very, very carefully and are a believer, and it has to be both, Right there, you can see the mass 22 ion of neon, which was the first of these that was really observed on it. If in the book, in the original plate, it's almost visible. Uh, here, it really isn't. Now, this was another observation in his book. And I don't know whether or not I, I, the, the individual points don't seem to be there on it, but it had to have been taken by points. And what you'll notice is that this is the positive ion spectrum and this is the negative ion spectrum. And mass spectrometry has been characterized by positive ions for most of its time. Uh, in traditional electron ionization, you bombard a molecule with a negatively charged particle and you get positive ions. Be more about minor details. The other thing, if you notice down here, this was in 1914, and I'm not sure there's any significance, but this was the compound being analyzed, COCl2. 
uh, whether Thompson was supported by uh, the British Army, I'm not really sure. Uh, for those of us under, <clears throat> under 60, what is COCL2? Under 60. <laughs> FOSG, not the world's most pleasant compound. Okay, in the book, he, several things that were there. The sharpness of lines shows that all particles have the same degree of mass, same mass. Well, if you looked at the lines, they weren't terribly sharp in my estimation either. Helium is monatomic, not exactly new. Hydrogen and oxygen diatomic, not exactly new, but that was all right, his instrument showed it. Everything except hydrogen, you can get multiply charged species. And this was, some, this was new and somewhat unusual. Positive rays from methane give a whole bunch of fragmentation. So this is the thing that we've used since then. Okay. Uh, corpuscle, uh, a term that I doubt has been seen by anybody in mm, probably 90 years. This was his terminology for an electron. And it was a high energy discharge, and it was not predominantly just a loss of that significant amount of fragmentation and decomposition. Uh, experimental observation that the petroleum chemists discovered afterwards that the hydrocarbons have very similar spectra. Okay, now I, the mass spectrometers sort of claim that we discovered, and I claim to be a mass spectrometrist, that we discovered isotopes. And that's not really quite true, because isotopes were done before. So this is a, a, an article by uh, Saadi, who got the Nobel Prize later on it. And what he did was to measure the atomic weight by chemical means of lead from different sources. And I would fuss at my undergraduate students if they published data, whoops, if they publish data like this, but this was from the data. So what he was doing was determining the volume of silver chloride to react with the lead chloride from the lead. And this was ordinary lead, and this was what he observed with lead from a thorite mineral. The numbers are significantly different. Using another batch of silver nitrate, and another thorite sample, he got these two values. The atomic weight of lead is 207. I hope that's on there. Whoops. I did. I did rehearse this. Um, oh, there it is. The atomic weight of ordinary, the average atomic weight of lead is 207. So this was a clear indication that the radioactive processes gave different uh, gave isotopes of stable molecules. T. W. Richards at Harvard, the first uh, American to win the Nobel Prize for his determination of the atomic weights, did something similar. This was again sources of lead from from a different uh, decay process, and significantly different values. And if you read. Um, Richard's paper about the details of what they did, A, the paper goes on forever, and B, it was extraordinarily tedious to do. And then his comments are over here, because they had made measurements of a large number of, uh, the atomic weights of a large number of elements, and had not seen any evidence for this. The atomic weights were independent of the source for essentially everything that was there. And if you notice the careful weasel words down there, qualitative agreement to the hypothesis of. Slightly different from the way we approach things now. All right, now we get to Aston, uh, who got the Nobel Prize for this. And this is from his um, uh, book published in 1933. And these were the uh, photographic plates showing different isotopes that he observed for species. The Separation is reasonably good. The peaks are not as narrow as one would like, but considering the things at the time, it was about as good. It was as good as you could get. Uh, some of you, maybe a few of you, might remember 
when we had on loan from the uh, Chemical Heritage Foundation a copy of Aston's second mass, spectro mass spectrograph out in the lobby. And it was a nice, it, if you look at it, it was homemade, it was put together, you could see the sealing wax and the other things that were there, they really were there. And things were not always rosy and uh, unanimous among mass spectrometrists. You'll notice in this particular case, Aston is object, uh, sorry, yeah, Aston is objecting to somebody else appropriating the name of his instrument to describe something which is entirely different. Uh, now, we don't really care. The optical spectroscopists got into the game, and if you'll notice this, um, oxygen 18 in 1929, okay, uh, and then scientific communications were fairly rapidly. Uh, there was a rebuttal in the same a journal from Aston that he'd done the experiments and he didn't see any oxygen 18. But there's a, he was cautious there and less than one part in 500. So he gave, he gave himself an out on that one, and it turns out that it was less than one part in 500, and both oxygen 17 and, and oxygen 18 are there. And then there's something else which I doubt that anybody under the age of 60 has ever heard of. And if you want to impress people with your trivia, you ask them what the Meeky Childs factor is. And I doubt if even the front row remembers what the Meeky Childs factor is. Cecil? The Meeky Childs factor was the conversion factor between the chemical and physical atomic weights because the physicists immediately converted to oxygen 16 being oxygen 16. The chemists stayed with the atomic weight calculated on the basis of the average atomic weight. And so in 1962, the physicists sort of won and we converted to 12 rather than 16. Some interesting artifacts from Thomson's day. Uh, they prepared many of the things by bombarding with electrons. And I, the details of this, I don't know. I find it difficult to bombard platinum and understand how one can bombard platinum or palladium and get something of mass three. Um, but one did uh, for all, all kinds of things that are there. And I, I still don't know and it, it there. My guess is that there probably was some significant amount of water that's there. But whenever mass three was observed, there was always mass two. So that sort of helped. The mass two was hydrogen. We didn't have any problem with that. And then we wind up with this one, okay? That X3 is triatomic hydrogen. And it's a little difficult to tell because he's a little bit casual about charges. But I think in reading this, he decided that H3, as a neutral species, had a sporting chance of existing. Because this thing reads as this H3 versus O3, ozone, on there. And he was a physicist, so his minor details about chemical bonds don't really matter. However, a little bit later on, Dempster, who was another of the early mass spectrometers, showed very clearly that the origin of H3 was not from the ionization of H3 neutral molecules, but from ion molecule reactions. This obviously is the H2 plus, and as the pressure increases, you get collisions between the hydrogen ions and the hydrogen molecules, and mass three goes up and becomes the most abundant peak in the spectrum. And in fact, mass spectrometrists had no hope of ever determining deuterium, because everybody knew if you put much hydrogen in there, you would get H3 plus so you wouldn't be able to see or to detect HD. Okay, this is an, again, Dempster's instrument, entirely different, I'm not gonna talk much about instrumentation. But at this time, mass spectrometry was primarily inorganic mass spectrometry. And I regret that I didn't go back to find out why it was that many experimenters have used heated aluminum phosphate in their mass spectrometer. 
uh, most of us would not think of doing anything at all about that. But it was either heated or bombarded with electrons. And what you see is the low ionization potential species, which shows up later on when we talk, one talks about electrospray. You've got a lot of adducts that are there. This again, Dempster did not win the Nobel Prize, but he did a substantial amount of determination of isotopes and their abundances. The mass spectrograph was used primarily for identifying isotopes, the mass spectrometer for getting the relative abundances. And if you will note, those of you who've drawn curves on there, you see little things like points, points, points. So every one of them was an experimental measurement. You had to make a number and plot the thing to get it. It took a long time to get these data. No one was in a hurry. It didn't make any difference. If they were, it wasn't going to matter. All right. Now, uh, this was somewhat later on. And one of the things that isotope uh, mass spectrometers were used for were isotopic abundances. And this was uh, an, a, a description of an apparatus that uh, Al Nir made. And in this case, you, if you look at it, what you see is what mass spectrometers used to call a flat top peak. You wanted your ion beam to be small compared with your detector on there. So that in this case, you didn't have to hit exactly on that point. You could miss it a little bit. And this would aid greatly in getting uh, good isotope ratios. There was a, a biography of Near, who was uh, on the, in the National Academy. And in this particular case, in 1940, note, small quantities of the uranium isotopes have been isolated. They were separated by a mass spectrometer, i.e., uranium tetrabromide heated up, bombard it with electrons, and you will get uranium ions. And so they were separated. And what he did then was to collect these uranium-235 and 238 ions on a nichrome plate. And this is from the uh, biographical memoir of it. He sent sub-microgram quantities of the separated isotopes in a letter. Can you imagine what would happen now if anybody tried to do anything like that? And then the other experiment was to determine the fissions of those. And the observation was then that U-235 was responsible for the slow neutron fission. Um, again, this is from Aston's uh, Nobel lecture in 1922. Uh, Well-known hydrogen, it was greater than a quarter of that of helium. bragging about what the mass spectrometer did, although it was well known before then without any great problem. If hydrogen is transformed into helium, a certain mass must be annihilated in the process. And that mass will produce a significant amount of energy. And he's quoting Eddington rather than Einstein. But I think that's all right. And this one is if we. Uh, some people could discover how to release this energy in a form that could be employed. Powers beyond imagination. But the remote possibility exists that the success of this experiment might be pu published to large to the universe as a new star. So there was a significant concern then about this. All right, uh, again, in the 30s and 40s, ionization potentials, appearance potentials, ion energetics. Benzene was a large molecule uh, for most of the chemical physicists at that time. And this first set, this plot, is what are called ionization efficiency curves. You measure the ion current as a function of electron energy. And all of them have a relatively well-defined threshold uh, for Benzene, which is the lowest, this is the ionization potential, and the others are the uh, appearance potentials of the species. Now, that doesn't look so bad until you look at this, 
which is the way they got the mass spectrum. And you'll notice that the mass spectra were obtained point at a time as you went through. So there weren't going to be a lot of these experiments done because each one took a monumental amount of time. Those of you who complain about what you were doing in 115, life was much more difficult then. OK, one of the things you could do, you measure the ionization potential of molecules. The ionization potential, now it's the ionization energy, is the minimum energy required to produce the ion from the molecule. And this is a nicely illicit set of units, uh, which I still use periodically, an electron volt. And Joe Franklin, with whom I worked for many years, knew the 23 times table, because one electron volt is 23.05 kilocalories per mole on that one. So you can measure the ionization potential of benzene easily. You can measure the appearance potential of the ion at mass 28, sorry, from ethane on it. And then the question is, what was the other product? Well, it's sort of obvious that this is what it ought to be, but let's go back and do a little bit of checking on that. So you can go back, the, uh, again, the ionization potential of ethylene can be measured. That's mass 28. So 2 minus 3, first law of thermodynamics, and that's about all I remember these days. So I can go back then and can calculate that value. The current value is 1.4 electron volts. The value that they got then was 1.3 electron volts, with a reasonable estimate of the uncertainty. So you can go back then. The threshold process then was very likely to be that. You produce the ethylene ion and hydrogen molecules. And that's a reference. Um, Bauer was uh, editor of J.S. J.A.C.S. I think it was uh, physical chemistry on that one. And this was his comment that in the 30s, chemists were not really interested in mass spectrometry. Uh, Thompson had predicted its use in 1914 but chemists weren't really using it for much of anything. Isotope ratios were about the main thing that was there. And this was an example of very early work that Near did. And he observed, again, the data are reported the way we wouldn't do it right now. It's a carbon 12 to carbon 13 ratio. And the observation was then that the carbon rate isotopic ratio depends on the source. And this was the idea that then you could go back and you could identify the source of the material from the carbon-13 to carbon-12 ratio. And there are a lot of experiments which have been done this way. And there are some delightful things. Uh, high fructose corn syrup and honey have different carbon-13 to carbon-12 ratios. And there was a lovely paper a while back just showing that um, different brands of honey had distinct peaks corresponding to pure honey, pure high fructose corn syrup sold as honey, uh, and diluted at different stages. The most recent application, of course, is that some of the steroids have different carbon-13 to carbon-12 ratios, whether they are made uh, synthetically or whether they're made naturally. And that has been particularly embarrassing for people. The other thing that was there that came in about this time was the use of isotopes for chemical reactions. And this was the uh, Rittenbergs had did a substantial amount of work of that, using deuterium and subsequently nitrogen to get the mechanisms of reactions. And mass spectrometrists have used labeled compounds as a great way of playing things, and organic chemists as well. All right, mass spectrometry as we know it really began in the 1940s. And this was the beginning of it. Uh, Herbert Hoover, Jr. was the son of the president. And if you'll notice this article, the, it, it's not in one of the most widely read journals that are there. And it's sort of hard to find. But Herbert Hoover was the president of the company. And Harold Washburn was the director of research. And 
this was the first mass spectrometer that was really commercially available. It wasn't commercially available, but it was on its way. And what I like is the honesty in there. The results were considerably better than had first been anticipated. They were honest about these things. And the mass spectrometer was built, the original purpose, I think, but I've never really been able to verify it, was to sample, take sample, soil samples to see if you could detect hydrocarbons from them because then they would go out and that's where they would drill the well. Didn't work. Everything had oil in it. All right, and this is then the first mass spectrometer. This is the CEC-103, which was for a long time the most widely used mass spectrometer uh, anywhere around. It was a bulky piece of equipment. Uh, it looked as if you got your money's worth when you bought it, and that's what equipment used to be. You want it big to make sure that you got your money's worth out of it. And this was the, in the innards of it. Everything was heated. Uh, the, there was one very small vacuum pump, so you had to be very careful what it is that you do. Um, and one thing, if you'll notice up here, there had been a major improvement, and that's this thing. You no longer have to measure the abundance point by point, the oscillographic recorder. Has anybody in this room other than the 60 group seen an oscillographic recorder? Very good. Um, but they, they, they're a major improvement uh, over the other things that are there. And this is the kind of what you got off the chart. And this was a multi-pen recorder. And the, the top one is the most sensitive scale. The bottom is the least sensitive scale. And the conversion factors, I think, were 1, 3, 10, and 30, something like that, to be able to go to do it. And the way you measured, you took a ruler and you measured the peak height. I, and this was the example of what it was that they were doing. This is the reason why the instrument sold and sold to oil companies, because they were the ones, A, who had the money, and B, had the, that chance to use it. So they were analyzing mixtures of hydrocarbons. And sort of trivially, this is well before gas chromatography came in. So what the, the way of analyzing the thing before this was to take a distillation column, which required a substantial amount of material and a fairly long time. And so what they were doing then was to make a comparison of the values that they got with the fractionation versus their fancy play toy. And the agreement was really quite good and the amount of, it was a much shorter amount of time because the fractionation required at least eight hours, a full day to do, and a whopping amount of material to do the analysis. One of the problems with this, however, was because everything had to be heated up. Uh, it was used, and you wanted a lot of samples, you were careful about what you put in. And the things that you put in, which are of interest to most people outside of the oil companies, were the polar compounds. And the reason why you didn't put them in was because they stuck around for a while, called memory effects that were there. So you, people with mass spectrometers were fairly fussy about what they would put in their instruments. But after it reached the stage that they would be more venturesome and put something in, one of the classic examples were esters. And the methyl esters were used routinely for GCMS because the methyl esters gave fairly abundant molecular ions. The higher esters didn't. The methyl esters all gave acyl ions, which were characteristic of the acid that was there. And even those of us who were not, who never did terribly well in organic chemistry, can keep track of these things. Um, simple fragmentation was what it was that you expected uh, that was on there, and you got some weird things that were there in the mass 74. All methyl esters gave an ion at mass 74, and that comes from this rearrangement. It has to be a rearrangement because it has an even uh, mass on there, 
And this is the only uh, mass spectrometric uh, reaction that I can think of that's named. The McLafferty rearrangement, six-membered cyclic re reaction like that, characteristic of organic chemistry, pilfered from organic chemistry. Fred was an organic chemist. Okay. They also gave some double rearrangements of the protonated acids. And these came from this book, which is certainly one of the most important books in mass spectrometry. It was the way of ta interpreting the electron ionization spectra for many years. Okay, talking about making ionization measurements on it, there are lots of ways of doing it, and this is one of the ways, and the reason for sort of putting it in is uh, Fred Lossing was responsible for much of the information that was there on it. He was a Canadian on it. Uh, monoenergetic electrons, photoionization, photoelectron spectroscopy to give ionization potentials and appearance potentials for thermochemistry. Okay. So if we go back to this, you can measure the appearance potential of mass 15, a methyl group, from ethane. Remarkably few people in the world really care about that number. But a large number of people are actually interested in the dissociation energy of neutral ethane. And mass spectrometers were pretty good about being able to get the two together. You can measure the appearance potential of a fragment ion. You can measure the ionization potential of a fragment ion. And if you remember Hess's law, the appearance potential is equal to dissociation energy plus the ionization potential of that fragment. This is known. That's known. The dissociation energy of the carbon-carbon bond in ethane, 93 kilocalories per mole. And as I said, you just practice doing the 23 times table, and you can do these. And the current value from NIST is 90. And this book, Field and Franklin, and I will admit there's a little prejudice in my mind since I worked with both of them, is I think also one of the most important books in mass spectrometry because it was the first compilation of thermochemical data for mass spectrometry. When you bombard a, a, a molecule with an electron that has 70 electron volts, I'll multiply that by 23.05 to get it in kilocalories. Uh, and then you can convert it to kilojoules, which is even bigger. There wasn't an immediate opinion that the, that the, the ion had structure. It was an ion. You knew what the mass was, but people weren't always sure that it had structure. And you can go back, and this is Field and Franklin again on there. You can measure the appearance potential of ions. From that, you can calculate the heat of formation of the ion. And what these data show is the simplest case is that you can tell the difference between a primary and a secondary propyl ion. And the current NIST values are essentially the same. Now, um, this is back to the uh, petroleum industry game. If you use low energy electrons, you can ionize aromatic hydrocarbons and not ionize the other. And this was an example of using low voltage electron ionization at high resolution. And no, the peaks didn't come out like that on their own. What happened was that you had a very large oscillographic trace. Quite possibly this long. And the technician would be there measuring with a ruler every single peak in there to go back. The spectrum took, oh, probably an hour or so to determine. Uh, and the data analysis probably took at least that much to go through. Now, with the Fourier transform ICR, you get everything done 
with a much greater degree of precision if you look at this you see a ridiculous number of decimal places however they agree with the theory so I guess they're legitimate on it okay I need to talk about ion molecule reactions I don't really need to but I'm going to on that way um, at the beginning of mass spectrometry, everything was done at relatively high pressure. So there were a lot of collisions. There were ion molecule reactions that were there. As the technology improved, the vacuum improved, ion molecule collisions of ions with the molecules were sort of forgotten about and sort of disappeared. And then these three were the groups that came in and were responsible really for the uh, work done since then. Tal Rosia was a Russian physicist. Stevenson and Schistler worked at Shell Development. Field Franklin and Lamp worked at what was then the Humboldt Oil and Refining Company. And the reason why they were there was they had the mass spectrometers that they could do the experiments. Now, there's another one that was related to this, and this was an experiment which was done at Texaco. They were determining isotope ratios. And an experiment happened. The train to remove the water from the uh, combustion products uh, broke. So what they observed was that the isotope ratios were abnormally high. Or it didn't break, it just sort of ran out. And then what they did was the experiment to show that if you had extra hydrogen in there, or water in there, the 45 to 44 ratio was much higher than it should have been. If you had just helium in there, there was no particular problem. And so what they observed then, probably the first time anybody's done it, those two reacting to form HCO plus. Now they couldn't tell what the ion was and what the molecule was, but they knew it was happening. Okay, this, was Tal, this is a uh, translation of Tal Rosa's first experiment. The uh, experiment was done about 1950. The first reaction, well let's see, reaction three, didn't excite anybody. Mass 19 had been observed in mass spectrometers for years, and eh, who cares? Uh, the formation of propyl ion from propylene, eh, acid catalyzed reactions, we don't worry about them. But this one was the weirdo. CH5 plus. And if you write CH5 plus, most organic can, you have to be sure that they see the plus because otherwise CH5 is not one of the favorite things. And when I would give talks for quite a while uh, after this, um, and I would talk about CH5 plus, with reasonable certainty, some member of the faculty would say, surely you mean CH3 plus, not CH5 plus. But now CH5 plus is respectable and it's in many organic texts. But this was the weird thing that was there, and then it led to a, a lot of reactions. Shell development, the ion molecule reaction, simple molecules that were there, and the, again, every group do, doesn't really try to keep people out, but we're successful. You notice the, well, sort of here, 10 to the minus 9 for rate constant. But if you go back and look at the other units, it's 10 to the minus 9 cubic centimeters per molecule second. Well, if you want to convert that into rate constants that ordinary people do, <coughs> you multiply it by Avogadro's number, which is 6 times 10 to the 23rd. That makes that number look very, very large, and they are. And this was the observation. The reactions are essentially temperature independent. They occur at essentially every collision. And this has been one of the postulates in ion chemistry since then. This is not a particularly good picture, but this is the Humble S.O. Rockefeller chemical physics mass spectrometer. It began at Humble. Uh, it stayed at Humble and was called S.O. Then it moved up to New Jersey and was S.O. Then it moved with Frank Field to Rockefeller on there. And people of not necessarily importance, but that is Frank Field, and that is the technician Wilburn Giger, who was probably the most important member of the group because he could make the thing work on there. Frank had that, bit, that piece of equipment uh, 
built, and if you look at it, it looks big. It was big. Uh, it occupied that whole room that was there. You wanted to make it look as if you got your money's worth. And then here's some data, and as Professor Burmeister has said, c'est moi. It was F.H. Field and J.L. Franklin. It was much easier to be M.S.B. Munson than to try to discuss the matter. And so what we did then was just to increase the pressure in the source of the mass spectrometer. And you saw an increasing number of collisions. Before, the pressure was about in that region. So you could see the products, but you couldn't really tell that anything had reacted. In this case, you could see the primary ions disappearing, the product ions increasing. And these were the curves that we calculated from the kinetics. Those are the experimental data. And the reviewers let us get away with it. Uh, as you increase the pressure, what you could see is consecutive reactions. In this case, CH2 plus reacts with methane to give C2H3 plus, which reacts with methane to give C3H5 plus. You can begin to see consecutive reactions that were there, and the idea of maybe some polymerization things occurring. Uh, extending it by another factor of 10. Uh, Wilbert and I did this, began doing this the year that Frank was on sabbatical at Leeds. But uh, we made sure that he knew what it was we were doing. So this was the case, and this was overall, and these were the real data. And you can tell those are real data. Nobody would go to that much trouble to fake them. Uh, and the reason why there is a spread that's there is it took us a very long time to get reproducible data out of that. We rediscovered that at high pressures, the ion distribution is extraordinarily sensitive to trace impurities that you are absolutely positive you got out and had no business being in there. But that was the case. And that was our kinetics. So what our observation was, once you formed CH5+, plus, it just sat there. It didn't do anything. It didn't react with methane at all. And since we had no idea what CH5+, plus was, and in fact, Frank and I didn't even think of it having a structure. It was just mass 17. Um, I doubt that anybody really, most people had doubts about our data because you don't do kinetic data by varying the pressure. So this was using a Fourier transform ICR, and they got the same results that we did, that CH5 plus does not react with methane to give anything interesting. C2H5 plus does not react with methane to give anything interesting. And what we did then, having gone to a great deal of trouble to get everything out, was you add just a little bit to see what happens. And in this case, we did. And if you add a little bit of ethane to it, you see then the CH5 plus is formed, decays, C2H5 plus is formed. So that says that CH5 plus reacts with ethane to form that. With propane, you get the similar things that are occurring, hydride transfer and proton transfer. So this led us to think that CH5 plus had a sport as an acid. That says methane is a base. How many of you believe methane is a base? I do, but that's about it. <laughs> now, we were, we were very impressed with it. We thought this was just great. Unfortunately, it was very old hat. Uh, this was an experiment which was done with a discharge in air at about a tenth of a millimeter. And the last time I checked, air was 80% nitrogen. And if you'll note in here, there is remarkably little that he calls 28. And the reason why there isn't any 28 is that the nitrogen ion has reacted with oxygen to give O2 plus. And this was expected there. The other thing that's there, in this particular case, he's labeled this ion at 18.7. And I'll bet a dollar and a quarter that it's not 18.7, but it's 19 from H3O plus. 
because there's always going to be a little bit of water around in the instrument. So this was very well known. We just had read the 1930 literature. Um, this was where we began to do some things. We were working for an oil company, and the idea is that you might want to do something. Methane was a drug on the market. Nobody cared for that one or the other. Find some, do something with methane to make it into a useful product. And this was also the time when radiation chemistry was around. You were supposed to take your reactor, you'd send your feed stream in, it did its thing. On the end, you distilled it, and you got the products that came out. Well, it didn't work that way, but what we were doing then was just adding things to it to see what the reactions were. We had no idea what the chemistry of CH5 plus would be. We didn't have any feeling at all for what it was going to do. And in this case, we have two hexanes, two hexane isomers. Uh, you could get them from Phillips Research, 99.9% .9 pure. We never synthesized anything. Neither Frank and I had, or I had talent in that area. And what you see in this particular case is you have similar, you have the same ions, but different concentrations, different abundances. And this was the case. Maybe we've done something useful. And that was this one chemical ionization, and this was the first paper of it in 1966. Okay? And alcohols have been sort of an embarrassment to mass spectrometers for a good while because the standard electron ionization spectrum gives an undetectable molecular ion. And you like to know what the molecular weight of the compound is, and you can't really tell it. And most of the fragments down here are not particularly useful. So the methane chemical ionization spectrum didn't give molecular weight plus one, gave molecular weight minus one, and this fragment ion is there. So you can interpret these reactions very easily in terms of proton transfer followed by dissociation. And we remembered that oxygen was a good leaving group on there. And the ethyl ion would abstract a proton, or a sorry, a extract a hydride ion. And I'll let you read this. <laughs> the review was actually longer than that, <coughs> of the same tone. Uh, so if you submit a paper and get an adverse review, uh, I assure you that you're not the only one in this particular category. If, if I had been the sole author on that paper, chemical ionization would never have been published. Frank was a very well-known mass spectrometrist and a very strong-willed person. We made minor changes in the paper. I wish I had a copy of the letter that he wrote to the editor when he sent it back because it was likely to be fairly vitriolic, and the paper was published. <laughs> Shortly after that, this came out. Uh, and one of the reasons why chemical ionization actually became useful was because Hank Fails and his group did it with molecules that people were interested in. Frank and I were doing it with, we've well, got these and go on, but biomedical molecules were of interest then, and they still are. And this is the next review of chemical ionization. I like that much better. <laughs> because it could. You go back and it, you, if for this thing, what you expect to get, and you see this is the protonated molecule, molecular weight plus one. This is the loss of water. This is the cleavage at there. So the main functional groups show up really very nicely, and it's easy to get. And the electron ionization spectrum OK, another technique that was around about this time was field ionization, because the object was to get high, uh, ion, analyze high molecular weight compounds. And high molecular weight was maybe four or 500 then. And the reason for putting this one in is that field ionization, in this particular case, they used a razor blade. And what you had then is if you have a very strong voltage of field of about a volt per angstrom, you can take neutral molecules and ionize them. And they ionize without fragmentation, which is what it was that one wanted on there. 
but the molecule still had to be vaporized, but you could ionize and you could get high molecular weight species. And the next one on this one was uh, field desorption. The molecule still had to be volatile, and a lot of things were thermally unstable. High molecular weight compounds basically weren't. And this was then one of the problems in it, in field desorption. You had to grow these little dendritic wires there. It was a major effort to do that. But then you put your sample on here. You didn't have to vaporize it. And you, you have their voltage of a volt per angstrom on it. You would get ions that came off. And this was the spectrum of bradykinin, probably the most studied compound that's anywhere around. And you did see some molecular ions, and you saw useful fragment ions. So field desorption was another way of getting to high molecular weight species. There was a period of time when it was interesting. The idea was if you could heat something fast enough, you could vaporize it before it decomposed. And this was probably the most successful of those. And this was Californium fission fragment or plasma desorption. And this was not an accident. CI was an accident. This one was not. Uh, Ron McFarland was a physicist. And what he did then was to take the sample, put it on a film, bombard the back of the sample with decay products from Californium. You got ions that came off, and you collected them. And when this paper came out, I suspect most spectrometrists, most mass spectrometrists laughed at it because you'll notice that the resolution is not much. The peaks aren't very much. But this was the first time that a spectrum had been observed of any molecule that was as thermally labile as this one was. Again, in the rapid heating game, fast atom bombardment, there are a whole bunch of other things that were there. And in this case, uh, what you're doing is you have your sample dissolved in an inert matrix. You bomb out it with atoms. Xenon uh, was generally used, very expensive, but that's all right. And what you would see in principle was that you would get some protonated ions of high molecular weight coming off. And I pilfered this particular slide from Tanaka's Nobel address. Again, this is a fab spectrum. And if you see, this is a good one obtained much later on. And what you see in this particular case is mass spectrometers had to change the way we thought about things. Because if you're working with low molecular weight compounds, the carbon-12 isotope is the dominant species that are there. If you happen to have 100 carbon atoms in it, the carbon-12 isotope is not very abundant. And you get this real miserable cluster that's there. And this was Catherine's work on that. OK, laser desorption ionization. Laser desorption ionization, again, another rapid heating thing. Thank you for coming, Jean. Rapid heating, OK? But if what happened was if the laser, if the molecule absorbs the laser ionization, it fragments. So laser ionization was not terribly useful because you got mostly fragmentation. And then um, Tanaka's first thing was using these ultrafine metal particles. I didn't really know about this until I read his review on it. I don't think it made any difference what they were. These were particles around 100 nanometers there. The particles absorbed the laser light, transferred the energy to the molecules, and vaporized them so they were mostly intact. Not the world's best looking spectrum, but it gives a molecule of molecular weight 34,000, which nobody had ever seen before. And it also, uh, you get the oligomers of those. So this was the first time that anybody really got high molecular weight compounds so that you could get accurate, accurate molecular weights of them. I'm almost through. Well, a little bit. The last one there is a, an entirely different way of making ions there. And this is electrospray, which is probably the most popular source of, in uh, method, method in mass spectrometry now. 
And this was the first paper, not by John Finn, who received the Nobel Prize, but by Malcolm Dole. And Finn was always very careful to acknowledge Dole's work on this. And what you have then is you have uh, an electric field, a pinhole. You let the gas go through the pinhole. In the presence of an electric field, you get a charge on the ions. And what you can do then is if you evaporate the solvent, you're not heating up anything. If you evaporate the solvent, you can get ions. And this was his first eh, sort of spectrum. He couldn't measure the masses of the ions. They were well beyond that. But what he could do was then put a retarding potential on it so that ions of different masses would get through or not get through. And this was then uh, leading to this final statement. Can demonstrate conclusively, well, most other people didn't believe it was conclusive either. But you can get macro ions, different charges, get them in the gas state without ever having to vaporize the molecules. In principle, there was essentially no upper mass limit. Okay. John Fenn came into this uh, in, the, in the 80s on there, and this was his uh, first mass spectrometer for that. And the Chemical Heritage Foundation has his first mass spectrometer that he won the Nobel Prize for. And the difference was, in this case, that he has nitrogen gas coming through. So you hear the, you get a discharge here, and the nitrogen gas comes through here and will evaporate the solvent. So you just have the ions by themselves. So the ions were in the liquid phase. You don't vaporize them. You remove the solvent from them, and they come on in. And this was the, one of the early spectra that he got for that, uh, lithium salts in methanol water mixtures. And his comment was that the reviewers were singularly uh, uninterested in this paper, and it barely got published also on that. So, um, Reviewers aren't always the best. And then this one, uh, the title of his Nobel address was Electrospray Wings for Elephants, or Making Elephants Fly. And in this particular case, what you observe is in electrospray, multi-charged ions, a lot of them. This happens to be the one of, with 18 protons on it. And you get this cluster of ions that come out for the different charge states. You need a computer to go back and do it. And when you go back and do all of those, you get this as the molecular weight and a fairly abundant intensity. So using the data analysis system that, you, that now exists, you can go back and there's probably an upper limit, but I think people have reported masses of maybe a million or something like that. Thank you. Thank you very much, Bert. Uh, do you have any questions? This is not a question, but a comment. I, I never dreamed I'd listen to a Munson talk and learn something that has moved me to my very foundations. Malcolm Dole taught me physical chemistry at Northwestern. I had no idea he was that important. The thing that you showed, which I think you described as uh, tungsten wire, it looked like a bottle brush with high mm -hmm. surface area and, and very sharp objects. Yeah. Was that, in fact, an oxidized? How did you make that? Uh, what, well, I d it wasn't oxidized. What you were doing, you had the wire that was there, and you heated it up, and it was mostly ca carbon filaments that were there. Uh, I don't know the techniques, and I've got, I can't find my book on field desorption that was there. 
but there's extended discussion as to how they made that. Uh, you treated the, the, the hot wire with oh, I, all kinds of things to go back to make it come out. And making those things was really at that time very difficult to do because you needed essentially pinpoints so that you could get the high field strength to get the field desorption that's occurring. I think you can probably buy them now. You can buy it for about $45 for one of those. I have yeah. to launch it on. It's <laughs> $45. Yeah, I think. This is certainly the best for the record, but I am curious. What is the current record for a molecular line? I don't know. Part of the problem is detecting it, right? Because uh, you've got uh, detectors, these ion detectors. Uh, typically, you have to have at least some velocity. It's not kinetic energy. You have to have some velocity to, to strike uh, a detector to get a cascade of electrons. And so that is what limits it. Uh, people that do just charge detection, if you have enough, are, are up over 10 million. So yeah, yeah, you can, yeah, you, you, yeah, you, you, you can actually, in fact, people have uh, taken individual virus environments, virus molecules. And, Ionized those, sent them to a mass through a mass spectrometer, collected them on a plate on the other side, and, uh, and, and they still yeah. yeah, I'm not sure that there is an upper limit. It's in it's in the millions. For a while, there there was a game. I can get higher in mass than you, but that's that's over now. But eventually, you have the problem: the carbon 13 isotope uh, pattern just gets you, so you don't have just a single line. You have sort of a bra range of masses, so there's a lot of discussion about how, not only how high you can go, but how useful is it to go high in base to charge. Questions? So you work for uh, an asset which is like oil company, right? How are you able to do this? Uh, that was at the, that no, that, that no longer exists. Uh, I, have, I came through really, I think, at uh, just about the peak of time. Uh, the best of times for research, uh, certainly industrial research. Partly because Joe Franklin was there. Uh, he was, well, it was the Humboldt Oil and Refining Company. Uh, his brother happened to be the manager of the refinery that was there. Uh, but they, they knew the, some of the directors and so forth. So at this time, every company did some fundamental research. Shell Development did. Uh, all the others did some fundamental research. Not an awful lot, but this was clearly fundamental research. Joe's group, which I managed to join, thank goodness, uh, was doing that. Uh, papers were published. The, there was a general idea that the reaction of these ions was connected to uh, catalyzed reactions that are going on. So there was a basis for it, and it turned out to be analytically useful. But this was just, this was just a, a small group that was doing it. There was a group of three or four who were doing it, a group of three or four at, at Shell Development and uh, at, at other places. But that no longer really exists. Uh, the other thing that was there, which was absolutely unique, which was a, a result of Joe Franklin, was that we had uh, periodic lectures. Somebody would, we had outstanding people come in. I took a course in irreversible thermodynamics from Ilya Prigozhin. I remember absolutely nothing about it, but uh, it was there. Uh, and we had visiting scientists who would come in, and you would be off for work for two weeks, a way of trying to keep people current with other areas that are going on. Again, that no longer exists. Tom. As you think back over your illustrious career as a researcher, what was it that really kept you excited about what you were doing? Was it curiosity about the molecules and the chemistry, or was it the hope that something you did would have some um, practical application? No, I go back to the time when it was, what's going to happen? I don't know. And, and, and that was it. The, I, in fact, I think it was Frank who, who thought of the uh, analytical applications of chemical ionization. I was just sort of curious as to what happens if you do this. Can we predict? Can we do things on there? So the practical applications, no. That wasn't what I was aiming for. 
I was just curious, what happens if you do this? And for a while you could get away with it. You can't now. Bernie, it's worthwhile pointing out that the gentleman who left Burlings, who unfortunately had to leave, is another time in the field of management. Yes. G. Cottrell, yeah. who had been the chair of his department for 10 years. Gene was also at Humble, um, and he left to go to Wright Patterson uh, on there, and then went on to other things. Uh, we were both presidents of the Mass Spectrometry Society. He's now at PNNL. Um, hasn't quite retired, but close, but he's still active in research. Actually, he has. I have a card saying he's emeritus. Okay, yeah. Any other questions? All right, well, let's thank for one more. Thank you for coming and staying awake.